Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next The Promised Neverland manga review. This one is going to be for volume 9 of the manga, which is called The Battle Begins. Uh, in this one, the chapters that we cover are chapters uh, 71 to 79. We've got uh, Real Intentions Call, Rallying Up, A Special Child, Unyielding Reed, um, the battle begins, the foolish weaklings, one down, and everything put in this one shot. This probably is one of, if not my favorite volume of the Prom Promised Neverland so far. I think it just has a mix of sort of everything that is kind of good about the series all in one. You have the very uh, kind of big world building, uh, kind of mystery focus bit at the start with, I suppose, the recording from William Minerva. You have this sort of shock, surprise, twist reveal in the middle, and then you have the action-centered kind of uh, final third of the volume with the start of the battle against the, the poacher demons. So, um, just really, really, really good volume. Nothing really to complain about with this one, so let's just get straight into it. So. Where we finished off last volume, um, obviously Lucas and Emma were going down into the room that he was unable to open because he didn't have a pen. Emma has the pen, so they're able to go in. And when they go through the door, they find first a control room, but then uh, beside that they find what is, I suppose, actually Goldie Pond. This is the section that actually is the pond and it's actually just a settlement built on top of it but this is the actual pond section and inside they find some very interesting stuff of like there's water but it, it water that doesn't make them wet like they can't really touch it it's, it's almost like it's a hologram of some sort or something like that but uh, they they walk through it over into this building and they find an elevator which is a pretty notable kind of point here um, that they find this because this is the elevator that is meant to bring them from the demon world into the human world and that is you know exactly what it's, it's meant to be um, and they go to activate it but it says failure and they, they think it's going to work it doesn't but it's so interesting that it's just it's right there and, and they even talk to each other about how there's no way it can be this simple. There's no way we can literally just activate this and we're just straight away back in the human world. And of course, it, it fails. But then the phone rings. There's a phone there and it rings. And when they pick it up, it is William Minerva on the phone. It turns out that it's actually just a recording. But what is said here, I think it's just, it's very important. So I'm gonna go through this in a decent amount of detail. Um, he says, uh, I first need to apologize to you, I'm sorry. The elevator is the path to go to the human world, but it can't be used anymore. Um, then what he says is, uh, I, I don't know what year and what month you are in right now, but the fact that you're listening to this recording means the elevator still doesn't move. It was stopped, they blocked the path. It was, it, it's my fault, I didn't expect that, that the one I trusted would betray me. The settlement that I made here is probably not safe anymore either. Perhaps the one who betrayed me destroyed it or they found out about it. I wanted to atone. My real name is James Rattery. Uh, I'm a descendant of the clan that came up with the promise with them a thousand years ago. So that's really interesting and, and they go into the detail here. He says, I am the 35th head of the clan. My clan has been the mediator between the two worlds to keep this promise. For a thousand years, uh, generation after generation, we've been forcing the ultimate sacrifice upon you children to keep order in the human world. I cannot abandon my duty for the sake of the human world, but as a human being, I couldn't endure this injustice. So I wanted to give you a chance to choose your own future. That's why I slipped cl clues into the books, going to the farms, pretending to be an imaginary person named William Minerva. Um, they were small clues, but, uh, but at least to the children who noticed them, I wanted to provide them a safe shelter and a secret path to cross over to the other world without getting caught. But the path was blocked and the settlement probably cannot be used, and the schemes the one who betrayed me um, have, my, have my clan after my life. Uh, currently, it's May 20th, 2031. By the time you're listening to this recording, I'm likely already deceased. 
Um, I'm sorry, but this is not a loss. Uh, I'm not going to let them kill me easily. And you have supporters other than me. The path between the worlds isn't just that one elevator. It may be dangerous, but there are multiple paths, such as um, Gracefield House and Glory Bell, uh, uh, Grand Valley and Goodwill Ridge. Uh, and unlike, unlike the one here at Goldie Pond, the path inside those four top class farms will never be blocked. Um, choose the future you want. If you want to go to the human world in secret, I'll have supporters come get you. You, uh, and if you have friends, all of them too, could use one of the paths to cross. Or, if you don't want that and you want to destroy th this distorted order and break the promise, go ahead and do so. If that results in a full-scale war with them and the two worlds go back to the situation of being hunter and prey, no one can blame you. I will not break the promise myself, but if you want that, neither I nor my supporters will stop you. But, if the future you want is neither of those, search for the seven walls. Um, I regret that I have no more time. The rest of the details are in uh, Marvine's bed. Everything you need will be there. Good job getting there. I'm sure you suffered a lot, yet you per persevered to get here. You, or maybe there are a few of you. I wanted to hear your voices. I wanted to meet you all. There is happiness and you can obtain it. Please live. I wish you good luck. And we, I suppose, get uh, our first actual look at the guy here. Um, just there. So that is what he actually looks like. Uh, and the idea is that this pretty much wraps up the William Minerva plot um, of just the reveal of he is the head of the clan who was part of, I suppose, the main family who negotiated with the demons to create the promise. And he has seen what's happened and has been trying his best to, in a way, give something, any chance to the kids who have suffered to make this promise a reality, any chance for them to escape. Um, and that's why he's been doing this. And... It's, it's interesting because like, it's like, here, here's this elevator, but they blocked it. They found out about it. They betrayed him. Someone uh, betrayed him and realistically he's dead. We find out later on that this was actually 15 years ago. I think we get a, a bit of, a little bit ago. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it, but it's like 2046 or something like that. So, you know, he died a long time ago. This event in the past happened a while ago, but... Um, lots of interesting stuff in this back and forth. I suppose the most interesting thing is that straight away, wait, there's a way into the human world, a path through all of the um, top class farms, including Gracefield House. That is an incredible reveal because I don't think anyone expected that. And it's just this shocking thing where like it's part of the plan anyway for Emma to go back there and get Phil and the others out. So getting them out could be a matter of just going there and finding the the exit into the human world. So the nature of these exits is also interesting in that are like they borderline saying it's a teleporter of some sort. Um in that like okay it's a elevator, but like does it go up, is it down, is it some weird underground thing? But like like, I suppose, are they basically saying, is this like an elevator, like, through the world in some way? Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to kind of judge, because it could be weird technology, especially with the weird water that isn't water that was there. The fact that it's like a floating kind of uh, kind of building. But, um, you know, really, really interesting. And, and especially him presenting the idea of, like, the choice is now up to you. Do you just want to, like, secretly escape and just be happy that you've got out of this bad situation or do you want to like violently try and end this like break the promise and stop what's been happening to them who were basically sacrificed like they are born into this demon society just to be food basically because the humans when the promise was made just gave a certain amount of humans to the demons to act as you know some sort of good faith agreement when the deal was made or, you know, if you don't want either of them, um, you know, search for the seven walls, which is exactly what was said to her before by Mujika. So that's very, very interesting. That it, It's the, the hint that's, I suppose, a bigger plan beyond just Emma's one, which is to just get her 
clear group, you know, her family to safety. Um, and obviously they're, they're setting up that there's going to be a lot more going on just with the amount of characters she's met already with the man back in the shelter. Now the group that's there at Goldie Pond who's being hunted. There's so many more people who are suddenly going to be included in this escape attempt. They found out about the experimental farms and all this stuff. There's going to be a bigger thing and they're presenting this idea of, I suppose ultimately, changing the world, you know, I suppose breaking the promise or changing the promise in some way to fix things so that they're better between humans and demons and potentially get into like the origin of all of this and what exactly is going on. But um, just really, really well done. Um, but after that, the next chapter again is set in September 2031. So this is a couple of months after uh, the recording is made um, by uh, was it James Rattray, wasn't it? Um, yeah, James Rattray. And then, yeah, here we get to meet his brother, Peter Rattray, who was the one who betrayed him. He found out about this and basically sent him to his death. Um, but they say, you know, they haven't found his body yet. And Peter demands that they find it. Even if it's just his bones, they have to make sure that they do this. So they're borderline setting up the idea that like, okay, that there's maybe still some potential that he's out there somewhere, but still what we get here is Peter Rattray, who's on the younger side of things, we kind of see him here and seems a little bit younger uh, than you'd maybe think. But, you know, he just says that not only did you, he, he talks about how all this stuff, you know, I can't believe that you actually went to do this, what you were trying to do, creating a base for the children, this big settlement that you made. And he says that a shelter may be overlooked, but that place cannot be allowed to exist. And so he announces himself there. He's the 36th head of the Rattray clan, and he goes to uh, Lord Bayon to discuss something with him. And the idea is, I think very clearly, this is where the the way Goldie Pond gets to be the way it is. Uh, Peter gets around the fact that, you know, I suppose they might be punished by the demons for having this uh, settlement be there. Um, even if it, even even though it was um, James's fault, they'll be punished for this. So instead he goes to Lord Bayon and I suppose offers him this deal of like, we don't usually allow this to happen, but what if I let you, you know, use this place to act as this kind of poaching ground for you. They don't fully get there, but I think that's the, the basic idea. And then, yeah, as we go into the next section, we get that present day is January 2046. So this was 15 years ago that the recording was made. So that's very, very interesting. But they figure out that the, uh, the, the code that he mentioned, the, the secrets of what's going on are hidden in the drawer there. They find a secret kind of back to the drawer and they find inside basically an extra cap or memory chip for the pen and they kind of switch out the one that was on it for this one and all of a sudden it has all of these new sort of projections. It has everything that they basically wanted. This is the one about the paths to cross over. This is the one about how to get in touch with the supporters. This is a blueprint of Goldie Pond. Um, it does show everything. Um, and then, yeah, so that's what they meant by the seven walls. They also get this mention of this Project Lambda 7214. And it said that this is a project to, a project to build in the far west a new experimental farm. And that's all that, that, all that said there. So very interesting in that like effectively Emma has just read and understood a lot of super super important information. For us as the readers we're kind of like can you please tell us about the seven walls so we have any sense of what that's about. And it's very interesting that just immediately she gets what's being talked about with that in terms of this like third option that will change things for the better apparently. And um, so very, very interesting for sure. But, um, you know, Lucas and Emma have this sort of conversation as they kind of head back out to tell everyone. And it's that, you know, okay, uh, he was actually trying to help us. It gives them sort of renewed hope. But the one thing they have to get past is the fact that Lucas has sort of lied about things to the other kids that he said that there was a human community that they can get to 
and that was a lie, they actually have to get to the whole other side of the world to go to the human world. But very quickly it's revealed that everyone doesn't have a problem with it. They trust Lucas and that knowing that actually there's an even safer place than the human community that he lied about actually helps to give them even more hope. So very, very interesting stuff. Uh, but then here's where sort of the big twist happens. I remember reading this digitally when the, the book came out digitally uh, about a month ago or so, uh, volume nine. And this just blew me away. I was just like, wait, are you doing a flashback here or what? But uh, the way this comes about is that suddenly the focus goes back on Adam, who's obviously the big kind of bulky kid who is not given any sort of explanation previously. But uh, they say he rarely talks and we don't know where he came from. When he does talk, it's to himself, and he just repeats the same number over and over again. 22194, 22194, 22194. And obviously, if you're paying attention, that's Norman's number. And then they go ahead with that by um, <laughs> noting that, you know, that is indeed Norman. They kind of make it fairly clear here by getting that across that that was, in fact, Norman's number. And then chapter 74 just starts with like Norman there like waking up and you're not really sure what it is because usually in manga when the, when it's a flashback the background of the page is done in black whereas you can see here the border bits uh, just around here it's the standard color of the page not printed upon uh, whereas if it was a flashback it would be done in black like they show in a little bit but it seems like he's just in a, a different but standard farm you know they check his vitals, everything is normal, normal. Uh, they give him food, um, he has to perform tests and the doctors there say that he has a perfect score again, he got all 200 problems correct. They're even, the Grace Field tests are already difficult, but our tests go even further. He's a special child, no wonder he was chosen for this facility. And. Um, he, you, you see him, he's kind of sad here, he says that he misses them, so this is the first time I suppose we really get the, over these few pages, we get the sense of like, he's alive. And it's such a big twist, because they're so casual about it, just like, turn the page, there he is, he's alive. And then you remember, especially with the anime having aired not that long ago, you'll note that they never actually like, show the death of Norman, they don't do what they did with like, uh, Connie, I think, was the girl in like the first episode. They don't show her having been killed. I think what they do is they show like a demon arriving, and then they're like, "You don't need to see him die. You know what this means. What he's do. What's being done here." But it's it's this clever way to sort of leave it open where they could just commit to it being that way, where he was just dead. That he just died. You just didn't need to see it. But here. They give a reason, I suppose, for like why he was taken away, because he is so special, that there's a bigger plan for him. And, and I think it works even more because this isn't one of those shows where they've overly like teased characters dying and then like shocked you that they survived. Um, this is it doing it for the first time. They hit home the emotional sacrifice of Norman so much that this is why the escape happened in the first place was because he sacrificed himself basically. He set everything up and then accepted his death to allow everyone to get away. But they never showed it to you and so it's, it's a great twist because of what they do here. Um, so he says, I want to see them, Emma, Ray and everyone else. Were they able to escape safely, every single one of them? And this is where we get the flashback. You can see here on this page the again how it's done where um, up here, it's still sort of present day. So the background of the page is uh, still the standard white. But then as they go into flashback here, the, it has the black background, which is usually sh to show flashback. So that's a, another nice thing that they do here. So we see him being taken away basically to his death apparently, but he's brought before Peter Rattray here, who is apparently his new father. Um, but he says, we may be too close in age for you to call me father. Please call me Peter. My name is Peter Rattray. I want you to help me, to assist me with my richer research. And so Isabel, uh, Isabella says goodbye to him. And you see him reacting to just the fact that, you know, this is also a farm. I'm their food. I've just been moved to a different cage. 
nevertheless I can live and it's like d can he get out of this place can he escape from here on his own he masterminded the escape even though he wasn't part of it can he get out of this one now and he says what do I have to do to stay alive what will get me killed uh, where are the demons who are th those humans why are there no other children here you know what is the research he's asking all of these questions and most importantly what is this farm creating and raising so this page also helps to explain to us before they confirm it a little bit later on that obviously here's where i suppose adam is from basically um the kind of very sort of mutated humans which is exactly what adam is and we'll see him in a little bit in a minute then they go into explaining how like everything's recorded uh, there's cameras installed everywhere that he is uh, he has a tracking device on his wrist uh, he now has a, a second marking which is the exact same one that adam has kind of on his chest um, and he confirms to us that he has to get away from this place lambda 7214 so this is what was mentioned before the experimental new farm built in the west that's where he is and he says i'm going to live survive and i'm going to see emma and everyone else again so that is a great setup and they just kind of cut away from it here the rest of the book is focused on the setup for the fight against the poacher demons but that's brilliant that you now have this just as interesting you know secondary plot with Norman pretty much on his own escaping. And also, uh, they, they show a little bit more on Adam, I think. Um, and also, I suppose, just the flashback of like how Adam escaped or how he got to be involved here and so on. But uh, I suppose we'll get to see that in a second. And yeah, yeah, it's basically the next page where we see that here. So here is the um, Adam page where he sees Norman and sort of remembers the... The name there's no real i suppose significance presented about it other than that like he sees him and notes the number and remembers it i suppose it's probably his first time seeing someone with a number marking so he remembers it we don't really know the significance behind it just yet but you know still so yeah we have the rest of the group so emma and the other kids uh, preparing for their i suppose fight back here the next time the bell rings the, the music plays i mean so they do some gun training and so on. And uh, it's real that they actually all know how to fight really well. They know what a demon's weak spot is and how to kill them. They've just waited, despite all the losses and the deaths, they've waited to make it the perfect surprise when they finally actually decide to fight back. That way... You know the poachers will be honestly shocked by how skilled they are when they do fight back um and so they again set up the idea that uh, luvis is the threat that they can sort of deal with the others luvis is the big problem and this is when the others explain to emma what happened to lucas and his former group uh, this is where we obviously get the guy from the shelter set up as the leader who effectively explained to them how to use the weapons and defend themselves survivability and so on and that group really pushed the the demon hunters except when luvis came in and he did the thing that he's basically trying to do here with emma where he tormented them he killed them slowly one by one to drive lucas and the guy from the shelters uh, malice and revenge just to enjoy the fun uh, which is exactly what happened with Emma, back with the whole um, Monica and Jake thing and so on. And that's when we get uh, a little bit of, I suppose, remembering this, that Theo was the one who kind of suffered the most for this. He survived, his brother and sister didn't. And, you know, just confirming that they're all, they all are driven to do this because they've all lost someone. And most recently... They lost Monica and Jake and, and two others as well because four were killed just the, the last time. Um, and they just confirm, you know, that they're not weak. They're going to do this. And then all of a sudden the music starts playing. And they weren't expecting this because it, the hunt happened like just yesterday, basically. So they're, they're completely caught uh, unawares here. But they're so well trained at this point that they can adapt to it. Um... And yeah, we get another shot back with the demons here talking about things. And um, 
one of the demons talks about, you know, what, what are the, the, the ranks and so on, and uh, it's explained again that uh, Emma is a high grade, another one is also a high grade, and there's also an adult there. They're the main people that they're looking for. Um, so, yeah, and then just setting up, like, I suppose, who the demons are, the different, like, uh, groups that they have here, and the reason that they're hunting a second day in a row is that because of the arrival of Emma and her, I suppose, getting Luvis kind of invested in this, everyone is suddenly invested in that, like, one of them was nearly killed, if not for Luvis, so they're all sort of hyped up for this completely. Um, and yeah, just before the battle properly begins, we get properly introduced to them. So we have Luvis, who's obviously the big threat. We have Bayon, who is, I suppose, the kind of wealthy leader guy. Um, we have uh, Luce, or Luce, who is the guy with the really long face, who has, like, loads of eyes. And then the two, like, the two kind of thin-looking kind of ones are Noose and Numa. And they are the four groups. So the Noose and Numa are like a duo. And then it's important to handle the other ones, um, and and that's basically what we get. We get we basically get different groups of the kids here handling different uh, different demons and different teams. So um, Emma is going to be part of the team that draws Luvis away because it's important to sort of leave him until last so they can deal with him most effectively. Uh, so the first one we get is uh, primarily uh, Jillian here with a couple of the other characters, but Jillian's sort of the focus of this. Um, she draws uh, Luce or Luce away, uh, who's uh, who they reveal is like the weakest one because he tends to rely on his subordinates and he himself gets a little too emotional in things and doesn't think things through. Um, so that's he's also particularly annoyed about things because he was nearly killed the other day. They add some personal uh, impact for Jillian because uh, he was the one who, you know, killed someone close to her not that long ago, and he said to her, I'll give you 10 seconds to run away. So um, that kind of comes back later on, of course. Um, and what's really funny here is obviously that they, they completely... They, with him, you get the perfect character to do the sudden reveal with. He is confident because he's the poacher, he has the strength, the power, but suddenly they reveal that they're skilled and the tables are turned. And she, it's a really cool uh, shot here, like they just turn around, she's there standing there with two machine guns and just opens fire on them completely, as does sort of everyone else there. And, um, this is where we get, I suppose, the technical explanation of what's going on here. Um, he notes that, oh, they're, they're aiming for my mask and my eyes, my life. Um, but that shouldn't be a problem because they can't aim accurately enough to hit the small kind of eye hole. And my mask is too strong to be broken by normal bullets. So I'm safe and my men will regenerate. It's no problem. But then all of a sudden, as she runs out of ammo, he suddenly looks around and sees that all of his subordinates have actually been killed and this is where it's been revealed that they were this was their approach to handling him where they'd spray bullets around and act like they were going for him when they were actually aiming to take out his subordinates who were most of his power and they do this by basically shooting the sides of the subordinates masks which are smaller and the effective idea is that they do so much damage that like to the sides that it effectively sort of like rips his face off from the sides it's pretty interesting um, and so they sort of have him cornered at this point and he, and he he just goes full coward at this point you know we, we get a bunch of pages of him running away and the, Jillian and the other guy having complete control over the situation um, and eventually after you think she's waited too long she's talking to him a little bit too much something's going to happen something horrific is going to happen you know, you know, she, she she has her moment where she does speak to him. She gets her, her revenge in a way. She says, "I'll give you ten seconds." Just kidding, um, and she says, "Says someone so worthless did this to us." And she she pulls the trigger and does kill him. So Luce is taken out here, and it's revealed that uh, we're six minutes and twenty two seconds in, one down. Uh, uh, I suppose three groups to go, and. Um, 
Next, we go to dealing with the twins. Uh, these two uh, demons here. And we have uh, Sandy and Sonia, who are the, the main two attacking these two. Um, and the idea here is that they both note that with these two, like uh, Luce was a different story. All the other demons that they're fighting here, they really have no chance against one-on-one. -on -one. They have to do some, some tricks and some technical things to get the advantage on these ones. So uh, what they do here is they, they continue to sort of run away um, and they realize that they have to stop their movement, that, that, that their only chance is going to be to sort of lock them in place and then use their kind of special tactic that they prepared for this. They could get rid of Luce, no problem, but with the others, they're going to have to break the masks. And in this case, what they do is that it's revealed that they managed to, from loads of weapons over the course of all these years, they managed to make a couple of weapons that were able to break masks, that were going to be powerful enough to break the masks. But they only have a few of those guns, and they only have, I think, five bullets. Uh, so they reveal that uh, the plan is for uh, one shot for Bayon, two shots for Luvis, because he's the biggest threat, two shots for uh, the, the two twins here, like one each. Um, and effectively, they do this thing where they've planned all these traps to sort of limit their movement, and it seems like that's the complete plan. And what they do is they manage to lure them into a situation where they get through those traps, but and they arrive really close to the two of them, and they're prepared. They're wearing goggles, they activate a flashbang grenade, uh, which blinds them temporarily. Sonya manages to nail one of them in the face, breaking the mask, um, but then she gets kind of grabbed and held onto. But this turns out to be the exact situation they were preparing for, that the demons tend to go a bit overboard once they kind of have their prey and they feel like they have control. So this is the perfect time to shoot, and it's revealed that it, it wasn't just two of the kids here fighting these two, it's actually four. And it's revealed that, uh, I think it's Violet and, what's the other girl's name? Uh, Violet and Paula are up in the trees as snipers, and so they take out one of them, one left, and pretty much that's, that's the kind of cliffhanger in a way. They set up the idea that Emma has told them that uh, another way to easily hit the target is when the enemy is occupied with its prey, because that's how she was able to take out the demon beast uh, a little bit ago. So, we're left with the idea that it's now sort of two snipers, two on the ground, versus the one remaining of those two twins, as on the very final page, Emma is confronted by Luvis, uh, and he says, we meet again, number 63194, Emma, and there is the final page. So, yeah, uh, excellent volume, great world building at the start, amazing twist with revealing that uh, Norman is alive again and just creating a whole another story about what he's up to. And now you have that emotional reunion of, obviously, Emma and Ray actually have to reunite because we know that uh, Ray and the guy from the shelter are also coming into things. So I suppose that's the volume 10 setup that... Uh, I actually don't know what happens beyond this. I haven't read anything beyond volume 9, so the chapters I'm reading next are completely new to me. So I'm assuming that that'll be the big reinforcements. Things will probably go a little bit wrong in all of this. Luvis probably will end up being a threat. The guy from the shelter and Ray will come back in and sort of turn the tides. Uh, and then obviously it's probably set up for much later on the reunion of Ray and Emma with Norman whenever he potentially makes his escape or whatever. Uh, but that's thinking way off into the future. But um, uh, yeah, and then the action I thought was actually really well done in terms of going in depth on the mask, the different bullets that they're using, the tactics, not just, you know, military tactics, but also like they've acted all these years like they've been sort of helpless. They've been able to escape effectively, but never at tactically attack back now that they're able to do that. And, and they managed to take out, I suppose, what, two of the five d demons so far already. So I like that the pacing is actually fairly good, like it's just within a third of a volume, a, a, just a handful of chapters, you know, you've already taken out two of them already, and you set up the fact that I suppose Bayon and Luvis are going to be the two kind of tricky ones to deal with. But um, yeah, that's been volume nine of The Promised Neverland.
very 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 good volume but uh in the comments let me know what your thoughts are on this volume but that's been the video thanks for watching and bye